hey, hey, welcome back. This is the Advanced Blockchain Development Tools course, and we've been working hard and ready to add VRAM to a smart contract. We've got the card game contract ready to go. We have uh, Zeus SDK all set up. All we have to do is make the necessary changes to the smart contract in order to add VRAM, and we'll be able to deploy card game with scalable, affordable, decentralized storage, which means we might even be able to deploy it on mainnet. Jury's still out still on whether we'll do that or not. And so open the card game folder under contracts EOS, and we're only gonna be dealing with the cardgame.hpp file. This is the only file we're gonna be dealing with. We need to include a new file right here, which will enable VRAM for us. Any files necessary for certain DAP services, for example, if you were running oracles, you'd go ahead and put the oracle header file up here. But we are just doing VRAM right now, so that's all we need there. Now the way this is gonna work is again, we're kind of tricking EOS into having these features. Uh, so we're going to do things that normally aren't allowed in the contract, and our DAP service providers will pick up that those are feature requests. In this case, they are requests to use VRAM. And we need to set a number of preprocessor directives down here, including DAP services actions. And of course this, if you're not familiar, just means we're continuing the line. We'll always need signal. And for VRAM, we're gonna include the IPFS actions. So it's X signal action and IPFS actions. And then we're gonna go ahead and define commands as well. IPFS service commands. DAP network services, while they do have, with the exception of VRAM and CPU, they have names like Liquid Link, Liquid Oracles, Liquid Accounts. Uh, they also have internal names that you'll see, for instance, Liquid Accounts is kind of unwieldy. It's called V Accounts generally. Well. Whenever we see IPFS, IPFS service referred to here, we're usually talking about VRAM. And then finally, we do need to set the contract name as card game or whatever your contract name is gonna be because we're going to replace this stuff here with a macro contract start. And we need to terminate it with contract end. Now the contract end, since we already served the name here, contract end statement will not have the contract name. Just all of our public actions listed. That's it for this stage. Now we need to step into the actual contract itself and do a little bit of work with our tables so that VRAM will be used by the contract. Let's head down to where our table defs are. We're not gonna touch seed. Seed will just remain in RAM. After all, it's seed isn't a huge amount of data. It's just, it's just keeping a seed. So we'll keep seed in RAM, but the user info table, which includes this game struct, and a game struct is quite large, including numerous vectors, that is a good candidate to convert to VRAM. And it also only has one key, there's no secondary key at right now. VRAM doesn't support secondary indices. There's only one index on this table. So despite it being a multi-index table, so first we're gonna take our main type def here for our users table. And we're gonna change the type from EOSIO multi-index to DAP multi-index. That's what we included here with DAP services multi-index header file. And it, it's a drop-in replacement, although you do need to make some other changes, that enables VRAM for this users table. So the contracts, many references to the users table, if you recall, user users is is everywhere it holds game data it holds user data it holds uh, card data it holds absolutely every kind of data that is held in this contract just except the random seed is held in users so we just replaced that table with a dap multi-index table a vram enabled table now we won't be able to query this table as if it's a normal user's table, like we did in API service prior. We won't be able to do that anymore from the client side, unless we do something else here. So we're gonna create a new type def here. It's 
the same struct and we'll call it users table v ABI. And then we're also going to create an additional type def. And this is our EOS multi index type def. All right, and now we need the actual shard bucket struct that will be used for this V ABI, or rather this ABI table. And that's gonna look like this. We need the resource locator for the shard in question. And then of course, a primary key All right, so we just created a shard bucket struct for this, this table, and now that's actually it. So we did a little bit of magic up here with defines, including uh, these contract start and contract end macros. And then we modified our main table that we wanted to enable VRAM for. We didn't even modify the struct. We just dropped in DAP instead of EOSIO dap multi-index table and then we had to create this shard bucket table and that is all we needed to do let's save it and with that zeus can now compile our contract into a vram enabled dap i'm going to head back uh nodios is probably going to crash my video software again because it pulls up that firewall request but Oh, guys, I ruined it. I ruined it. Guess what? Look at that top error. Expected semicolon after struct. <laughs> oh, man. Come on. Uh, I do this. It's just like so basic. And as you know, every time I miss a semicolon after a struct declaration, it's reinforcing behavior. Also, uh, make sure you don't have this closing brace. I know we're used to the class declaration up here that, that was here, where it was like, uh, you know, contract, card game, blah, 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 blah. And then it had an opening brace. We're used to having that class declaration end with a closing brace followed with a semicolon, but that'll mess you up because that's included in the contract start and contract end macros. So I also made that mistake. I'm going to save the file now, and this time... If we're not good to go, I'm quitting my job. All right, looks good. Looks like we have deployed. Now, uh, actually, we need to create a whole new account in order to do this because we're running on a new, fresh Nodio. So I'm gonna open a new terminal tab. Cleos is running. Um, and we need to create an account using the system contract thing we did before. So we need to do wallet unlock, uh, which means I need that password. So let's go to that passwords file. Mm. Copy out this password. Cleos wallet unlock, our tutorial wallet. And uh, then do Cleos system new account with game player 42, the public key and resources required. It's executed, the, the account now exists. I'll pull up Brave, I have this saved. Here we go. Oh no. So I'm gonna disappear here for a little bit. We do need to make some front end changes in order to enable VRAM. Here up here is the current API service file we have. Down here is the one we're going to end up with. And there's some V account stuff in here that we don't need to deal with. But uh, it'll, it'll help us see what the differences are. In fact, this is more similar than it looks because we have this stuff going on. Bring this all out to bear here. Okay, we're still doing basically the same thing that we did before we're getting table rows. But instead of using this typical method, 
we are using the IPFS service one method for get table row, of course, because we need to be able to access this table row, even though it's in VRAM, it's not currently in RAM when we're just reading data, right? The, f the simple act of reading data outside of the contract, just in the front end, does not warm the data up into RAM. So we need to, instead of awaiting the RPC, blah, 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 we can get rid of RPC entirely and replace that with this line right here. All right, so await post data, our endpoint, and then the IPFS service one, which is the VRAM service, get table row. All right now, we're not getting rows anymore. We're just getting a row. Earlier, we were getting rows. So we can get rid of limit one. And with get table row, we're not looking for a lower bound. We're actually looking for a key. And then we're just going to return one row rather than rows zero, because the result is just one single row. We don't need this JSON either. And uh, rather than code, this is contract now. And uh, I, I don't really need to do this, but it's a little cleaner looking. Looks more like the official sample. So that diffs will be easier if we have a problem later. All right, so now our get user by name function is up to date. I can probably head back over to the front end and give it a try now. It's telling me post data and endpoint are not defined. There is in fact a new post data function that's been added. Uh, it's a pretty simple looking function. Let's grab it, copy it in, paste it in here to our API service file. I must have pasted it in the wrong, oh yeah, I plopped it in the class. Let's take it out of there. Declare it up here. Okay, so now our post data is ready to go, where we're posting whatever the data is to whatever the URL is. And in our case, the URL we want to post data to is our endpoint, and then this, this is the rest of the URL right here. So we're posting data to the get table row. I was actually a little confused as to why endpoint is not defined. It's because it's declared out here in the take action function. Uh, it can't be declared there. Let's declare it up here. And we're also going to do this thing where I uh, set a, another variable named URL to be the endpoint. So now endpoint is declared in the proper scope. When you declare the variable inside a function, as you know, you can't then use it inside a different function. So now endpoint should be available as well to get user by name since it's declared up here. And there we are. All right, let's go ahead and log in as GamePlayer42. There we go, looking great. Let's see if we can actually start a game. Hey, whoa. All right, we just started a game on VRAM. Can we confirm that? Yeah, we can, we can definitely confirm that. Let's get the table for uh, the card game 1111 contract, also in scope 1111, the user's table. Oh. It doesn't have the things we're used to. It doesn't have like a username and a game status and all this other nonsense. It just has this shard identifier stored in the user's table. So our contract situation in our card game contract, our card, uh, that's the wrong file, the header file. Our card game situation where we declared the shard bucket as users table for the ABI. This table, the users table up here, is the table the contract works with as it's going through all these things, right? We have users, users, users. The only declaration of users with the underscore is right down here. It's a users table type. It's definitely a DAP multi-index table, and it definitely has this struct with all the game data and all that information involved. So the contract is working with that table, but, as far as the ABI is concerned, when you call the user's table, you instead hit this the shard bucket struct. So whereas the user's table does hold user data while the contract is working with it, this table that's exposed to Cleos via the ABI is not 
the same table. It's this table based on shard bucket. Right now, only this URI is being stored in RAM. No matter how large the amount of information, this is being stored in RAM. I wanna try something else here, right? Let's go and make a new account again. We're gonna use the same key, but this one's gonna be called Game Player 43. It's created. All right, I'm gonna go back into my, my game here and quit. All right, I want to log out entirely. There's no log out button. So, so I'm just gonna open this in a new incognito browser. Still fill the passwords, but Game Player 43 now is the account. So Game Player 43 has now started a brand new game. All right, 42 has this game going on. 43 has this verifiably different game going on. All right, I've got two accounts running two games. What does the table look like? Two shards. All right, so we've got two sets of data now ready to be warmed up when required. Subscribe, follow the channel, whatever you're, if you're watching on the platform, make sure you check out the text, do the little challenge afterwards, as always. So we have created affordable, scalable storage for our DAP. Now, of course, it's just running locally right now. We have a local DAP service provider that is providing this VRAM for us. But if we want to deploy it to testnet or mainnet, we can. We just have to stake to or otherwise obtain the services of a DAP service provider.